thanks for being with us and thanks for the wisdom that you shared. Um, I know that for many of us, Baltimore is on our mind. And many of us are carrying uh, the brothers and sisters who are out in the streets and the brothers and sisters who are in jail um, in our hearts and as we come in this morning. And um, one of the things that uh, one of the things that I think is is important for us to keep figuring out is uh, how do we support this movement to develop more strategic thinking as well as as well as expression of emotion, and that I mean this is being called a riot and as many things and as disciplined protests alongside uh, people who are angry. And so one thing I'm curious about is, how do you uh, see the expression of emotion via the anger and rage that's in the streets of Baltimore? And how do you see strategy in terms of developing disciplined campaigns to move this, this massive institution of mass incarceration? How do you see those two sitting hand in hand together? Well, that's a great question. That really is the question I think everyone is wrestling with right now. And I just want to first say thank you so much for inviting me here to be um, with you as you all are working through these questions and trying to figure out what it means to build a truly transformative movement to end mass incarceration. And, you know, I think like everybody in this room, um, I've been heartbroken over what I've seen happen, not only to Freddie Gray, but much of um, what has followed. And I've also been hugely inspired, you know, by the thousands of people who have taken to the streets and inspired by many of the young people who um, really were willing to be completely honest about how they feel and their own rage and pain. And although they may not have expressed it, always in ways that, you know, um, we feel most comfortable with, I think what we're seeing is very real and honest, um, and I'm grateful for all those who have been in the streets in recent days. Um, last night, there was on the New York Times website an article that was posted, many of you may have seen it already, I actually posted it to Facebook like, last night called We Are All Freddie Gray Now. Yeah. And it, I was surprised that the New York Times ran the piece because uh, it was written by a man who was actually arguing for violence. Um, he basically made the case that, you know, as someone who's grown up in Baltimore and knew all too well the brutality of the police and had been a victim of it, members of his family had been victims of it over and over again, um, that. He and many, many other young people are looking at the protests that have occurred around the country, protests that he feels were nonviolent, but ultimately yielded little in terms of results, and kind of asking the question, you know, um, why should we just keep holding hands with pastors and marching in the streets when nothing ever seems to change, um, and we just go home and then Weeks later or days later, there's another killing, another tragedy. Um, isn't it time now for us just to say to the elected leaders in Baltimore, you know, do the right thing and stop protecting the police or we're going to burn the city down? And I was grateful that the Times ran the piece because I think it was such an honest expression of what so many people are feeling, the sense of being tired and feeling like, We've been through this over and over again. How many times do we have to take to the streets, be nonviolent, hold hands with the pastors, only to watch it play out over and over again? And you know, my feeling is that this sense that so many people have that we've been trying nonviolence for a long time and it hasn't worked rests on kind of a false conception. Um, the nonviolent. <laughs> strategies and activists that so many people were committed to, really, at the, especially at, towards the end of King's life, is not what has been going on over the last four years. Um, I think it's time for us to have an honest conversation of what it means to build a truly strategic, nonviolent revolution against injustice. <laughs> Thing that has happened, and those are two different, very different things. 
um, it's necessary for us to take to the streets and protest when tragedy occurs. So I don't want to dismiss protests as somehow um, being in a, you know, unimportant. But we do have to find a way to transition from protest politics, reacting when bad things happening, um, to really the strategic, difficult work of how do we build a truly nonviolent revolution that ends, not just to end mass incarceration or cut our prison population by half, which is the stated goal of many, but ultimately a revolution that will you know, break this nation's habit of creating these massive systems of racial and social control. Um, you know, right now, I think we're in a very different place than we were five years ago. You know, when my book was first released, um, nobody wanted to talk about any of this stuff. You know, Obama had just been elected, we were in a Washington Post racialism, and we have overcome, and all of that. Um, but, you know, there have been a number of developments, um, including especially the uprising in Ferguson, which I think, you know, we really are going to have to look back at as a turning point um, for you know, this movement as a whole, but also, you know, over the last five years, we've had politicians across the political spectrum now coming together saying, oh, maybe it's time to rethink this massive prison state we've, you know, created because we don't want to raise taxes on the predominantly white <laughs> middle class. And so there's this moment where suddenly, you know, Hillary Clinton now is portraying herself as, you know, a champion of the movement to end mass incarceration when it was the Clinton administration that was a primary architect of, um, you know, the current system of racial and social control. So we're at this critically important moment now um, where people are awake and they're angry um, and there is a space politically um, for a meaningful conversation about uh, what's necessary. But I think that we have got to um, you know, move out of the space of just analyzing the problem. And we have to analyze it and understand it in order to respond um, you know, effectively to it. But we have to, I think, begin to have the hard conversations of, all right, if we're going to build you know, a, a radical movement um, that has the hope and promise of dismantling the system and birthing something new, what do we need to do it? Um, what, what's, what needs to happen you know, in our places of worship? What needs to happen in communities? What needs to happen in prisons? What needs to happen in street corners? What needs to happen in our schools? Um, and what infrastructure needs to be created? Um, you know, one of the frustrations that I've had is I've gone all over the country speaking, you know, in all kinds of, you know, arenas. I've been spoke, speaking in prisons, speaking in juvenile detention, speaking in churches, speaking at judicial conferences, speaking all these different places. And everywhere I go, people say, what do I do? Yeah. I want to join the movement, but what do I do? And, you know, right now, you know, there is not a single national organization, not one, not a single national organization that has deep grassroots connections to local communities that is focused like a laser on ending mass incarceration in America. Not one. Um, you know, so when people say, I want to join the movement, they often have no idea even what's going on in their own community um, to address. There's incredible work going on in communities all over the country, incredible work going on in Philadelphia, incredible work going all over, but people lack awareness of what's happening. It often feels disconnected, and there is no infrastructure that's created. There's membership-based organizations that are focused on ending the criminalization and disposal of generations for communities and communities of color. People don't know how to connect and to join, and um, I don't think we just simply have to replicate what was done in the 60s. We're in a new time, new era, new tools, new technology. It's a new era, but we still face many of the same questions, um, which is how do we actually build a movement that has revolutionary capacity and potential as opposed to just getting out and protesting about that. So, President Obama recently called the protesters and rioters in Baltimore yeah. uh, dozen criminals. I was very disappointed to hear that language, because yeah. I expected no from <laughs> This is typical of the thinking that the administration of not just our national leaders, but our 
local leader show. I was recently invited to a, a community policing meeting with the mayor of Philadelphia and the, and the commissioners at various organizations. And when it came my turn to speak, I looked around and said, you have the wrong people in this room. Because it was too many pastors and, and um, activists and community organizations who the young people do not listen to. That's right. So one question is, how do we connect the real voices in the community? I'll give you an example. We had a meeting at the Friends Center two weeks ago, where we had a political forum where we brought mayoral candidates to come out to speak. Across the hall, we had the Black Lives Matter people. And they would not walk across the room to talk to those politicians. So how do we make that connection? Yeah. <sighs> First, I share your deep disappointment with the use of the term thug by Obama, by the mayor of Baltimore, by so many folks who have gotten so accustomed to being able to dismiss yeah. Yeah. Um, the entire population just by a label. Yeah. They're thugs, they're felons, they're mm -hmm. criminals, a repeat offender, yeah. a gangbanger. These labels are meant to kind of trigger a, a mental switch in our brains so that we stop hearing, stop listening, and allow law enforcement just do whatever they do and give them a wide berth to do it. Um, and so I think we have to be very conscious that we don't in any way use language ourselves um, that has that same effect. In my book, I wrote it, you know, I started working on it seven years ago. I use the term ex-offender throughout the book. There's the term ex-offender. That is not language I would use today in writing a book. And I think in so many ways, formerly incarcerated people in the family have done such an enormous service to the movement um, by challenging even those of us who think <laughs> we're standing in solidarity um, about our language, about the way we talk, think, and frame um, the very issues that we're, oh, sorry, uh, that we're engaged in. Um, so that's I think, it's critically uh, important. But, you know, in terms of trying to get young people and political leaders in the same room and connected. I have very mixed feelings about it. Um, I think young people are entitled to their distrust. Um, and I don't necessarily think that the answer is simply for young people and the prevailing kind of political establishment to sit down and kind of work their issues out or for everyone to feel heard. Um, I'm always <laughs> for dialogue and trying to get increased understanding, but I think that there are often attempts by politicians and others to say, well, we want to talk to young people and hear from them, but there is almost sort of a co-optation um, yeah. that takes place yeah. of young people's um, anger and resentment, and um, rather than really giving young people a role or voice or some power, um, um, they feel as well, as long as they feel heard, then perhaps I can keep going on um, with the work um, that we're doing in business as usual. I, you know, I take a look at what's happening in Baltimore as well as what the Democratic Party has been doing for the last few decades. And I say, why would I, as a young person, trust? the current democratic establishment um, to hear me, to take my concerns seriously. Um, I'm for dialogue, but I also think that perhaps the time has come, maybe it's overdue, um, for young people and others um, to think seriously about building alternatives to the current political parties. Well, you know, I certainly don't have a blueprint for it, and I think that, you know, many of the young people and others, and I don't want to say just young people because I've talked to pastors, I've talked to a lot of folks who are tired of business as usual, um, old folks, veterans from previous movements who are willing um, to become serious of, about developing alternatives. But, um, you know, I think that we can, we ought to explore in more serious ways than we have in the past um, building alternative parties. 
you know, it seems too challenging and pie in the sky. You think about, well, you can't run a, uh, you know, a, a presidential candidate um, that isn't a Democrat or Republican. You need billions of dollars to do so. Um, but on a local level, it's possible for people and communities to begin to organize, to take over school boards and city councils and begin to build power outside of um, the prevailing machine. Um, machine. And uh, I think it's something that needs to be explored. And too often we wag our fingers and shame people in poor communities of color, young people, for not getting out to vote. You know, we say, oh, well, you can't complain if you don't get out to vote. And then they look at who's running and who's right. running the political machine right. and they say, why? Why? Why should I support this? And so I think, um, you know, one thing we need to consider is building real alternatives, um, so that we're not asking people um, simply to go meet with their legislator or to sign a petition or to support yet another Democrat who is hooked into the larger machine. Let me speak to that briefly. In Philadelphia, um, we pioneered the term "returning citizens" as a label that is positive yeah. for us who've had that experience of mass incarceration. And we also started what we call the block party, it stands for build, lobby, organize, campaign, to bring together Democrats, Republicans, the Green Party, whatever you are to come together and really build a community. But it's been extremely difficult to inspire people to come out and support it, returning citizens, because they've been so damaged yes. by the system, they have no faith. And ordinary people who think, well, that's a returning citizen thing. You know, they've been in jail and they're trying to build something for them, but they aren't looking at the greater community. Our concerns are the same, yes. the concerns of the greater community. And like in this election, um, we have had all candidates come to our forums, speak to us, and we're going to support a Republican candidate, a Green Party candidate, one candidate from the Free Dominion Party, who we never heard of. But he came out, he did a wonderful presentation, and he's in opposition to a, a Democratic city council person who has never done anything for us in our district. So you have to look at alternatives. Mm -hmm. So perhaps that's what you're speaking of in terms of, of bringing those elements together. Absolutely. I, I, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, I find one of the most promising and encouraging developments of the past several years is the growing movement of returning citizens, formerly incarcerated people who not only have managed to survive given all of the obstacles that are facing them, but are finding their voice and beginning to organize others for the restoration of their basic civil and human rights and who are helping to build this broader movement and contribute in the ways you know that that you described and i think it's incumbent on us to support those efforts um you know rather than just sitting back and saying oh well what can i do well many of these organizations are struggling financially Many of these organizations are being run on shoestring budgets where they're not only trying to organize for, you know, restoration of voting rights or ban the box or, you know, the list goes on, but are also trying to help people who have been formerly incarcerated just get a job or a roof over their head. And there's no resources available to support this kind of work. And so I think one of the things that we can do is to financially support the excellent work that is already occurring in these communities. And, um, you know, it, it's not always easy figuring out who's doing what in a community, but that's part of the work, is figuring out what is the good work that is being done that is desperately in need of our financial support, of our labor, of our volunteer resources, um, of our physical space, um, you know, that we can open these organizations, open our doors up to for these organizations and support the great work that's already occurring. And Wayne, one of the things you're talking about is how, how do people who are uh, how do people follow and build relationships with uh, a community that has been deeply othered, deeply isolated, and that 
one of the things, and, and here I'm talking a little bit to Quakers, uh, can be a challenge to follow. Quakers often like to create their own talking to some of y'all. <laughs> and so uh, I'm, I'm curious if you have uh, one or two examples. I, I know picking examples is always tricky because then it looks like you're holding one over another, but just uh, one or two examples of folks and groups who have been able to model uh, a kind of accompaniment with, sort of following, working with um, uh, returning citizens rather than a model of we go off, we create our own organization, and then we put a coalition together. But ones where we have, and that, that go deeper than just sort of financial support. Well, actually, let me ask you that question. You have, and please share a little bit about the, the, the book that you've written. That's um, not your fair at all. Yes, so. no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really important because, you know, what Daniel has done is um, do a, quite a bit of research about the organizing work that is going on around the country um, to really build a movement to end mass incarceration and has focused a lot on the work of um, returning citizens and um, the courageous work they're doing. And so I'm curious what you've been most impressed by as you've taken a look at this. I mean, the, the one example that comes to my mind is a group that was originally called Silicon Debug. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were called that because uh, they realized, and sort of it's a cute name, but they realized Silicon had a problem, which is all of these uh, workers who weren't the high pay tech industry, but the folks who did janitorial work, cleaned offices, folks who just did manual labor, and were paid incredibly low wages. And Silicon Debug began mostly as a sort of organizing effort to sort of have people get in the room together and talk about what some of their problems were. And uh, they began to hear stories over and over again of returning citizens struggling, people who were getting arrested on, under extraordinarily uh, questionable circumstances. Bogus. And, uh, and their intention originally had just been to create an organization almost like a union of these folks. And what they began to do is realize we need to get in deeper relationship because our intention of just supporting this way that we're coming at it is actually getting in our way. So we have to follow the needs of the people that we're working with. And the needs of the people largely had to butt up against the system of mass incarceration, particularly at the form of policing and at the form of uh, length of incarceration. Those are the two sort of pieces that they identified. Um, and so part of what they did was they did the work that organizers do, which is build a base of people who are uh, connecting with others um, and bringing in people who weren't returning citizens, but bringing in folks who had resources to connect with lawyers, et cetera. It gave them a chance to get politically challenged. Their leadership got questioned. And they began to also expand their political analysis that way. So I think that would be one that comes to my mind around that. Yes. Uh, I have some definite ideas on the subject. I mean, I like the events. Um, in Philadelphia, we have a lot of very vibrant organizations that are doing the real work in the community. And the problem is that they are not funded by the city or the state. They aren't recognized for the work. And they aren't funded by those who should be funding them. Many people in this room, many people in various visual organizations who have read your book or on mass incarceration committees ask, what can we do to push forward the movement? What you can do is you can support the organizations that are doing the real work of the movement. Mm -hmm. And don't act like we're not needed to identify. We are there. Go into the community and ask, who's doing what? If you go into Philadelphia and you ask a returning citizen, where can you find a job at? He's not going to tell you Rise. He's going to tell you TCRC. If you ask a prisoner who helps us when we're violated. They'll say Human Rights Coalition. They'll say Decarcerate PA. Um, if you're a young person and you come out of prison, you go to YAS, the Youth Arts self Empowerment Program. There are so many organizations with dedicated people. We created CAMI, the Coalition Against Mass Incarceration, out of the Unitarians having a teaching on mass incarceration. I was invited to that. And 
invited to the planning table. And my response was, listen, if this is a day where I come to your church and, no disrespect, a bunch of white people talk about mass incarceration, have some food, and go home feeling good about themselves, count me out. Yeah. I don't have time for that. And if you want to bring your resources together and create something lasting, I will help you do that. And so for six months prior to that, Marietta, Nancy, um, some wonderful people at the Unitarian Church formed this teaching. Brought a lot of folks together, and out of that, they created breakout groups. All had an assignment to, to attack mass incarceration on a certain level. From that came Canada. And it's an ongoing organization that is moving. They recently lobbied the Pennsylvania Council of Churches, which is 1,300 churches, to financially support them. If 1,300 churches gave $100 a month, then you have finances to move things forward. This is what we have to do. We have to go out in the community and say, this is what we need. Stop playing with us. This is the reality. Support us. I think that's such an excellent point. I, you know, one of the challenges, I had a wonderful conversation with a few folks at breakfast. I don't see where they are now, but there you go. <laughs> All right. Yes, I had a wonderful um, dialogue. One of the things that came up was that um, many nonprofit organizations are sort of held hostage by their funders in the sense that they have to frame their work and spin their message and define um, what they're up to in a way that will please um, their funders and they have to report about the nature of their work and meet certain targets in a way that will please funders and that for those organizations that really want to be about more radical change, um, it can be very difficult to figure out, well, how are we going to pay staff? How are we going to keep our doors open? And certainly one of the things that faith communities in particular can do is to help fund organizations that would not otherwise get funded or help to ensure that they have a certain baseline stability so they don't have to worry about whether um, you know, certain foundations are going to cut the cord or not. And, um, you know, I, I think very often we forget how much um, power we have in terms of our voices and our labor, but also how much money exists within um, progressive and radical circles to fund and support the kind of organizing and advocacy that really needs to occur. Um, so I, I, I just want to echo what you shared. It seems to me that, you know, at this moment, we have a critical need for organizations that are helping, you know, to ensure that those who are coming out of the system or who are being targeted by these who are living under occupation, um, helping folks to survive um, and have a genuine shot of real freedom, making it out um, alive in the era of mass incarceration. And so we need these you know, organizations, individuals that are actually just providing that critical level of support that's necessary. Um, I love Howard Thurman's book, Jesus and the Disinherited. Yes. And one of the points he makes is that it is critically important to meet the basic needs of survival for people before you have any expectations of them being engaged in a serious way in the movement. You can't look and say, oh, well, why aren't you know, more people rising up if the system is so bad? Well, they're trying to survive, right? They're trying to feed their kids, keep a roof over their heads. We've got to have a commitment to meeting the basic survival needs of people um, if we're going to be serious about building this movement. So there's that work that needs to be done. Um, I find that some faith communities sort of stop there with a the charity model of the work, right? So that work is necessary, but then there also has to be the work for abolition of the system as a whole. And um, that work of abolition is, you know, often the work that, you know, when we're open and explicit about it, um, some of the kind of traditional funders begin to get squeamish about and back away from. And there's a critically important role, I think, for funders and people of means to support um, that kind of work as well. 
can I, can I push on the Underground Railroad metaphor just for a second? So um, uh, it's one Quakers love to reference. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'm thinking about, so there's a group, a uh, new sanctuary movement here in Philadelphia. And, um, and they, uh, they are specifically working with undocumented uh, immigrants. Uh, who are increasingly one of the major areas of mass incarceration, so the growth rate as more and more people are getting detained and then thrown out of the country. And so um, one of the things that they have begun doing is creating out of their namesake of sanctuary, providing sanctuary to immigrants, undocumented immigrants, who are threatened with being final uh, exporting orders, so given their final deportation orders. So in Philadelphia this has happened and they were able to uh, get through public pressure um, a woman who was held for I think three months might have been a period of time, uh, held three months in a church um, and were able to get her final deportation order revoked. That's a different model than the charity model of the Underground Railroad. And the way you just sort of describe it, the Underground Railroad sort of linked it closely to, to charity, I just want us to tease out, which is the Underground Railroad wasn't just survival, it was survival with sacrifice. Right, right. And uh, where is the sacrifice? Where are the places, where are the folks who you see modeling doing that charity in a way that's sacrificial versus simply beneficial to myself? And if I could um, segue on to that, we have to look back at history and realize that the Underground Railroad was not just a vehicle for slaves to come to the North. Once they came to the North, they had to create a new life. Right. They had to build a infrastructure to move forward into the future. Right. So we look at mass incarceration, once a person comes out of that system, they have to build an infrastructure. Right. And this is where organizations, churches, Activists who are serious about mass incarceration can focus. It's on the community level. What happens to a person who's done 10, 15 years when they come out? What has been happening to the children of incarcerated parents, which we really don't talk about? This is a side of mass incarceration that really has to have more focus. When I was incarcerated, I had a wonderful family who stepped in and basically raised my kids for 18 years while I was incarcerated. What about the families that don't have that? What about the kids who are in DHS? We have children in our after school drop-in program whose father is doing a life in prison. That is a daunting challenge for a 10-year-old boy who will never walk with his father under a tree or have the normal relations that we take for granted for the rest of his life. What do you put in a place so that he can visit his father, build a relationship, and have that sort of male companionship and family arrangement that will turn him into a person who can exist in society in a positive manner and not be so hardened and cold to the system that he's one of the kids out there burning down buildings simply because he feels there's no hope and his whole life has to be threatened. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, I think one of the most important challenges we face is in treating the folks who have been labeled the felons or the criminals or even the children who are dealing with folks who are, with loved ones who are behind um, bars is asking ourselves, what is the level of care, compassion, and concern that folks deserve and that we can model? It's one thing to say, the system shouldn't be so punitive. The system should show care and concern. It's another question to say, what does it mean for me to show care and concern? What does it mean for my community to show care and concern? What does it mean for my faith group to show care and concern? And to be very concrete about what that looks like in terms of funding, in terms of volunteer support, in terms of the time that's spent, that's in terms of what is said publicly. What all of 
that I think is a very different kind of conversation that moves us away from just anal analyzing the problem to being very specific about what does it mean for me individually and our group collectively to do what we think our government ought to be doing. Um, if we believe our government should be acting with more care and concern, how does it look for us to demonstrate that in the lives of individuals? And there's countless ways um, that we can do it. And I think one of the great things about Daniel's book is that he identifies the fact that there is no one role for people to play, that mm -hmm. everyone is going to have different skills, talents, abilities, um, passions that they can bring to the movement. It's about figuring out what is the unique contribution that you individually or your group or organization can make to this. There's going to be a role for artists, there's going to be a role for healthcare workers, there's going to be a role for people who are psychologists and who can provide mental so health support. There's going to be a role for all of us in figuring out um, what can we do concretely. Um, you know, I think for me, as someone who is a writer, I'm constantly challenging myself, all right, how can my writing be of use? How can it serve the movement? And uh, we all have something to contribute. Um, and very often, I think it's easy for us to sit back and go, well, what can I do? Um, rather than being really honest about the skills, interests, capacities that we have and that there are opportunities right in our own local communities to apply them in a way that will be meaningful and valuable. Let's shift the conversation a little bit. In um, Pennsylvania, our misguided legislators in Harrisburg passed the Revictimization Relief Act which we call the Silencing Act. And while this was reported to silence, when we abode them all, it was very wide ranging and it could have affected community activists both inside the prison and here in the community. Now on Tuesday, April 28th, the district judge, Christopher Connor, struck down the law. He found that it was too broad, too vague, and it blatantly violates free speech protections. What are your thoughts about this law on legislation like this and this decision? I assume everyone here is familiar. <coughs> no? Well, OK. <laughs> um, well, this law was actually passed um, you know, here in Pennsylvania in response to announce What was the college, the university? Goddard. That, Goddard, Goddard. 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 OK, Goddard had invited uh, Mumia to deliver effectively a commencement um, address to students. Um, obviously, he couldn't. Does everybody know who Mumia is? No, no. They don't even know. Explain who Mumia is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mumia Abul Jamal is a political prisoner here in the United States who was. Um, convicted of murdering a police officer um, and although there have and he was sentenced to death um, and was on death row for a very long time where he wrote a number of books um, that are very powerful and I would encourage people if you're not familiar with Mumia's work to um, read his work which has been hugely influential um, for people particularly who have been working on prison abolition for a long time. Um, and uh, although there you know, were numerous questions raised about his you know, possible innocence um, in the years of his incarceration, there has been little receptivity <laughs> within our judicial system to uh, having a, another trial or a retrial, although the NAACP Legal Defense Fund did succeed in getting him off death row, um, where he is now, but he is still uh, incarcerated, facing life uh, in prison. And he's currently very, very ill, stricken um, with diabetes. And there are a lot of serious questions about whether he's receiving adequate medical health um, treatment. So, um, but Mumia, because he has been such a powerful voice and, um, you know, has been influential, um, many, many young people who have read his work and writing or listened to um, interviews that he's given on radios, he was asked 
to give a commencement address at Goddard College. Um, and of course, he couldn't be there in person, but his remarks could be shared with um, college community there. And um, police union in Philadelphia, as well as others, um, were so outraged that um, Mumia, who was a cop killer, um, could be given this kind of platform and treated with that kind of respect to be able to address and people that a law was passed in the state legislature barring, um, making it possible for victims, families, um, or other concerned citizens to bar someone who is in prison from speaking publicly. Wow. Um, yes. And um, they actually passed that law. The law was passed and fortunately was challenged um, by the ACLU and others and um, as just explained was recently struck down as a violation of free speech and I was very concerned at the time that the law was passed that there would be copycat legislation. Um, it's already extraordinarily difficult for people who are behind bars to communicate with the media or to share their stories or information about the conditions of their confinement. It's already extremely difficult and for a piece of legislation like this barring any form of communication um, the public, those behind bars at the quest of the victim's family or a group that feels aggrieved, um, was a, a blatant violation of the First Amendment, but also I think was at, was at risk of setting a very troubling precedent. This is a matter of education for those who weren't familiar with the law. As adopted by the legislator, the law was aimed at barring those convicted of and in some cases accused of crimes from speaking or acting in ways that would re-traumatize re the victims. Right. The measure granted the crime victim or prosecutors acting on their behalf the right to seek injunctive relief in court to stop any conduct by an offender or former inmate that perpetuates a crime's effect on the victim. What that would mean is, in my case, you know, just, just thinking for example, you know, I was a former bank robber. Now I'm community activist. If a bank teller from 25 years ago said, oh, I remember here, he traumatized me. He has no right to speak on anything. They could go to a court and effectively stop all my work. Those who are inside, you have so many community activists who are inside, teaching, sending their work out. That would have stopped all their work. Although this was aimed at stopping Momia's voice, it was wide-ranging right. and could have affected hundreds of thousands of people. There's media caricatures and portrayals, Hollywood depictions of who the criminals are and the felons, um, but we almost never hear from them, the people who have been labeled and branded and demonized. Um, but until we do, it's you know easy for us to believe the worst possible things about them and imagine um, that their lives are, aren't worth um, you know, affording basic dignity and respect. And so, you know, I, I don't know how many saw the video um, I posted on Facebook and that was circulated widely um, on social media of you know, gang members in Baltimore who came together to say, no, we did not call a truce in order to you know, engage in some grand conspiracy to kill the police. We came together because we want um, our communities to thrive. We're here because we're marching for justice for Freddie Gray. And watching these gang members speak so eloquently and passionately and with such sincerity about their love for their community, for their commitment um, to standing united, um, was really remarkable because we so rarely get to hear um, from the people who we think of as criminals or gangbangers. And at the end of the interview, the newscaster said, well, that's a different perspective. Here's the real. That's a different perspective, but that perspective is a real perspective that we just don't acknowledge. Exactly. Yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. I was blessed in my incarceration to be under the mentorship of Dr. Mitchell Shakur, who was a political prisoner and a wonderful 
freedom fighter, and he formed a circle of consciousness in every prison that he was in. And I spent 12 years, 12 years working with him, and we literally trained hundreds of young men to go back in society and do the same work. Many of them gang members. Yeah. Now, we never tried to get them to leave their set because that's their family. Right. People in society don't understand that. Yeah. You see gangs and you're looking at, he's a crip, blood, gangster disciple, as if it's something evil. It's a subculture, it's a family, it's a community. And there are some of the most articulate, intelligent brothers you ever want to meet. And they control certain areas of the community. The reality is, if communities want to reduce the violence, they want to have the community function better, you have to deal with the elements in the community who hold the real power, who hold the respect, and who are listened to by the young people in the yeah. community. Yes, sir. And until we get to the point where we're willing to deal with them on a real level, on a respectful level, and say, this is what we have, these are the resources that we bring. How can we help you to work inside the community? Then you will begin to see real change. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality. Mm -hmm. That's right. So turning again, um, I, I want to ask about uh, and you were mentioning that one of the things Quakers love to do is create policy. Uh, and, um, and one of the real concerns, uh, I think, for many of us, uh, for example, out of Baltimore, out of Ferguson, have been uh, calls for what I consider very cheap reforms. So calls that uh, would result in, uh, for example, body cameras has been one that has regularly gotten attention. Um, but also there's been other calls for, well, what we need to do is we just need to invest in more training uh, for the police so that they can do their job better mm -hmm. under an assumption that they're not doing their job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I would love it if you would speak a little bit about what are some of the cheap reforms that are out there and how do you uh, encourage people to get beyond the cheap reforms it, so that they can get to uh, what you're calling the transformational movement, the revolutionary movement. <coughs> yeah, you know, I I've, I've been a critic of police body cameras as um, being sort of a seductive, easy answer to the problem of police violence. Um, for a number of reasons, one is that those body cameras don't actually film the police, they film everyone they come in contact with. So, from my perspective, police body cameras is a way of placing um, poor communities of color under even greater surveillance. So as they're walking down the street in every interaction, they're videotaping who they come into contact with and who's doing what. It's not the police who are being videotaped, it's the people they come into contact with. and. Um, you know, I also think that there's a temptation to imagine that there's a technological solution um, to the problem of um, police officers being at war with the communities that they're paid to serve. And um, so I, I have resisted <laughs> those kinds of solutions, even though it's undeniable that, um, you know, Walter Scott, <laughs> um, killer would not be facing charges today if it hadn't been that someone had captured um, that incident on videotape. So there's no doubt that the capacity for ordinary people to videotape what police are actually doing really has blown open um, the public debate about um, police conduct in ways that, you know, wasn't possible before we had smartphones. So um, I think technology can be a tool, but I think the temptation to be uh, seduced into imagining that's going to solve these problems in a meaningful way really has to be resisted. Um, I, you know, I think really the question gets to what are we really after here? What, what, when we say that we want to end mass incarceration or we want to transform police departments, what are we really talking about? 
Um, and very often people say, well, we need to hire more black police officers, which clearly, if you've been to Baltimore, is not the answer or really right. Um, you need to, we need to engage in more training. And as you pointed out in your own question, is that rests on the assumption that somehow police aren't actually doing the job that we have assigned to them um, during a time where we're asking them to wage a literal war on poor communities of color. Um, and so I think we really are going to have to risk sounding unreasonable in our demands, you know. And I think as someone who's been trained as a lawyer and has worked as a forensic, it's a, been a difficult transition for, for me to make um, because, you know, you're, as a lawyer, you're trained to make demands and frame what you want in a way that is likely to be received well by a judge or by the majority of the population you're speaking to. But I think we're in a place right now where we have to begin to demand um, things that right now seem like they're not likely to be possible. Um, one of those things is demilitarizing the police yes. and transitioning yes. to you know, police officers. But we no longer want warriors in our communities. We want peace officers. Um, you know, in Britain, police don't even carry guns, um, even though the violent crime rate in Britain rivals our own. Um, you know, there's questions about whether they track violent crime in the same way or report it in the same way that we do, but the, if there's differences in terms of the violent crime rate, they're not severe, they're not dramatic. Um, and yet, they have a philosophy there that unless there's a standoff kind of situation where there absolutely needs to be lethal force brought to the scene, um, police officers do not, in their routine encounters with the public, you know, carry firearms. Um, the understanding is, is that they're there to diffuse situations and keep the peace rather than to escalate them or to use force and violence. And so I find that when I talk to people today about, well, should police even be carrying guns? People go, why are you crazy? You know, of course the police. And so many aspects of the way law enforcement operate in our country today have become so normalized in our consciousness that it just yes. seems unthinkable yeah. that our police wouldn't be militarized, that they wouldn't have, we wouldn't have SWAT teams, you know, executing routine drug um, warrants. That, but I think really challenging um, people in ways that make them uncomfortable and encouraging them to imagine that there is another way is really important. I also believe that we need to talk seriously about ending the drug war for real. That means not just legalizing marijuana. Um, it means decriminalizing, from my perspective, decriminalizing the simple possession of all drugs across the board and embracing a model more like Portugal. Um, you know, in Portugal, they decriminalized all drugs across the board, heroin, crack, you name it. If you're caught with simple possession of a small amount of drugs in Portugal, you are not going to be put in a cage. You are not going to be stripped of your basic civil and human rights. Um, you may be, you know, responded to as though you have a, a, a you know, potential um, health problem. You will be given access to drug treatment and support, but you are not going to be labeled a criminal and stripped of your basic civil and human rights. And after 10 years of Portugal decriminalizing the simple possession of all drugs across the board, rates of drug addiction and drug abuse declined. The numbers of people who were seeking drug treatment you know, rose um, as it was less stigmatized and people were less afraid of admitting um, their problems with drug addiction and drug abuse. And they reinvested the money that was once spent caging people into drug treatment and drug prevention. And so, you know, I think we've got to say, um, we want the police to stop um, enforcing, um, you know, these simple, you know, drug um, laws. We can demand that. The laws are on the book, but we can say we no longer want the police arresting people for these minor drug offenses or using drugs as an excuse to stop frisk chains um, people who are viewed as potential um, drug offenders. We want an end to that. But just ending it isn't enough. And I guess for me, this is another critically important piece um, of the work that gets overlooked, particularly in this kind of era where you know, we have bipartisan criminal justice reform on the table, which is that it's not enough simply to stop doing the bad thing. It's not enough to just say, okay, well, we're going to stop locking people up who are caught 
with marijuana in their pocket. No, we have to be committed to remedying the harm caused by the war that has been waged. We have to be committed to, you know, me reparations for the drug war. We have to be committed to investing every single penny that has been saved from not incarcerating people back into the communities that have been harmed the most in the forms of education and economic investment and drug treatment and all the rest. And so, you know, the consensus that's now emerging that maybe we should downsize our prison systems because they cost too much, I think we have to push back and say, oh no, we're going to be spending more money in the years to come. We're not only are we going to invest every single penny that's been saved back into the communities, but we're going to have to get serious um, about remedying the harm that's caused. Um, you know, our country has a habit of you know, creating these vast systems of racial social control and then just kind of walking away and asking everyone to move on. So after the Civil War, you know, we say, okay, we ended slavery. Um, sorry, you know, you're welcome. We're not sending, selling your children anymore. Now move on. Um, but there's no 40 acres and a meal, no, um, you know, meaningful reparations. Just move on. And then with Jim Crow, you end Jim Crow, we're taking the whites only signs down, but where is the effort to repair the harm that's caused? Um, what we've been offered instead of meaningful reparations um, or meaningful effort to repair the harm caused is affirmative action. Yeah. And you know, I think we have to be honest that affirmative action has benefited a relatively small segment of the community. And when I first heard that South Africa, you know, you know, in the years following, you know, apartheid, were and thinking that maybe they should, you know, pursue affirmative action rather than, you know, um, any kind of reparations for harms. Because I'm like, mm, this is here we go again. This is how people who have power and who benefit the system manage to maintain it while creating this appearance that much more progress is being made. So I think we have to end the wars and the war mentality, but also really build a movement that's about reinvesting in the communities that have been harmed. Yes. yes. And that is the basis of mass incarceration. Right. And it's an $80 billion a year business, mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. And what you just spoke about was a change in the culture of America. Mm -hmm. America is a culture built upon oppression, yes. built upon yes. conquest. Yes. So to expect that <coughs> folks who can't even agree on attacking the causes of mass incarceration are going to move toward that sort of thinking, that'd be a great paradigm shift that, um, personally, I don't think is any time in the future. Um, but my question is, some of my associates and I were discussing, should white supremacy be classified in the DSM? <laughs> Because it's the basis of mass incarceration. Well, I hadn't thought of that. Well, let me use this analogy. Drugs are considered a scourge on society because so many persons' lives have been devastated by drugs. So now we consider drugs and drug addiction, the thought, the action, as a mental disorder, mental illness, a disease. The mass incarceration, school to prison pipeline, um, police assassinations of unarmed black men, all these are a scourge to American society. Right. So in the name of public safety, should society move to have white supremacy classified in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual as a mental illness or a disease. Absolutely. I think what the question reveals is how important it is for us to not simply respond to symptoms, but to acknowledge that there is a disease, a real illness, right. um, that has to be addressed. And it's 
Um, it's a mental illness in many ways. But it's not limited to white folks, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that when we talk about white supremacy, we have to be clear that we're not just talking about how white folks can imagine um, themselves to be superior in many ways, but also have to be able to acknowledge the way in which that ideology um, has really corrupted the identities and um, um, ways of thinking and viewing, you know, folks of color in their own communities. Yes, most so how we've internalized much of that. Um, maybe some of you have heard of the book, The Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, you know, yes. you know, about which wrestles with some of that, the reality of how um, white supremacy gets internalized um, by all of us, and that it's a, that it is in many ways uh, an illness that has to be, that we have to recover from. Um, as a nation, and that although we've ended these various systems of slavery and Jim this basic illness of imagining that some groups of people defined largely by race, that there's just something fundamentally wrong with them. Uh, I think in all of the work that we do, and all of the advocacy, rather than just looking for the cheapest, easiest, quickest ways to change a law that's on the books, we need to actually be seeking out the big fights. We actually need to be looking for opportunities to force that public conversation that most of America would rather avoid. And I think we owe such a debt of gratitude to the young people in Ferguson yeah. who yeah. stood up when Michael Brown got shot down and stayed in the streets and began yeah. to force a public conversation right. that our nation had been content to avoid. And that, I think, helps to fuel the kind of cultural transformation um, that's necessary if we're going to do more than just tinker with the machine. Yeah.